And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Pamela Nance, who underwent her first near-death experience in early childhood, as well as unexplained paranormal and extraterrestrial phenomena, followed by an out-of-body experience as a teen and a second NDE as a young adult. For over 40 years, she has researched the survival of consciousness after death, interdimensional communications, paranormal, and UFO activity. Pamela, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for having me. I'm enjoying being here. Well, we are happy to have you. And if you don't mind, Pamela, can you start with your first NDE and we'll go from there? Sure. Um... So a few weeks before my sixth birthday, I came down with a really severe case of red measles. Um, This was about two years before the measles vaccine was uh, introduced. So if you uh, contracted measles back during that time period, you basically just um, had to ride it out. And it was very contagious and most children uh, came down with it. Unfortunately for me, I had a severe case, um, and the school of thought at that time was just to keep the child comfortable. There wasn't really anything a doctor could do because it was a viral infection, and so my parents had moved me into their bedroom to sort of sit vigil um, with me because I had an extremely high fever, a lot of congestion. My body was completely covered. Um, with the rash. And um, I'd say about three days into this illness, I was um, very uh, fevered. And I thought at one point, even as this young child, that I was dying. And I remember asking my dad, am I going to die? And he assured me that I was not going to. And and held me, I remember him hugging me and laying me back on the pillow. And the next moment, uh, when I opened my eyes, the ceiling of their bedroom had disappeared. I could see the blue sky, the white fluffy clouds, and this arm reaching down and taking my hand And off we went up through the clouds, um, just going faster and faster and faster. I could feel the wind on my face, um, my body moving through space. And we just ended up like in this area of a sort of an ancient village. Uh, We landed, so to speak, and, and this person that had taken my hand was really more of like a light being. He was, and I say he because I felt a male uh, presence coming from him, but he was totally surrounded in a brilliant white light. Um, I remember looking up and seeing his face, but it was almost blinding. He was so brilliant and bright. And as things kind of settled down and I realized that we were like somewhere else, um, a a village kind of came into view and he sort of waved his hand forward, like walk forward. And we went forward on this path into an ancient stonewalled village of small cottages that each were enclosed with little small stone walls and there were people tending gardens, children playing, um, animals grazing. The flowers were so beautiful and colorful and the grass was so green. Everything was like magnified a hundred times, just so bright and brilliant and beautiful. And these people were just carrying on their lives. But at one point, I made eye contact with one particular family. And 
there was a connection there with these people. They were brown skinned. Um, I'm not sure if they were Native American or of some other um, descent, but they were very ancient looking and their clothing and their surroundings. Um, but I knew at a soul level that they were my family. I, I had this connection to these people. And there was one little girl in particular that um, I connected with. Um, our eyes locked and it, it's, it's really difficult to describe, but there was so much love there with these people and a connection. And I looked back up at this celestial or light being, and he nodded his head as though he was affirming the feelings that I was having. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my parents' bed. You know, I opened my eyes. They started sobbing. Um, I don't know if they had been unable to uh, awaken me. Um, but they were they were very happy that I was conscious. And um, so the recovery after that took several weeks. Um, and little by little, they, you know, I became stronger. And it was still um, like late summer, early fall, a nice Indian summer. So they would take me out back of, of our house and sit me in my little rocking chair wrapped in a quilt. And off in the distance, I had a really great view of Pilot Mountain, and that's a local landmark in this area. It's a sacred mountain um, for the Native American tribes, um, most recently the Sora Indians. Um, so I would fixate on this mountain, and I found that over time, I would go in almost into a meditative state and leave my body. I was able to like come out of my physical body, fly up like a bird. If you've ever had a flying dream, that's what it felt like. I could see the terrain of the land and I would end up soaring around this mountaintop and looking down, you know, at a view um, that I would never have unless I, I was, you know, aerial because of the, the way the mountain is formed, you can't get up on the top. So I had a great view of these ravens that nest up there. Uh, they're a rare breed. And then I would come home, pop back in my body, and my parents would still be sitting there chatting, and they didn't never, you know, acted um, as though they realized anything was going on. A little later, I did confide in my mom and told her what was happening. Um, my mother was very open-minded to spiritual type occurrences. She um, was Native American ancestry, um, Cherokee Indian. Her, her great-grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee, so that would have been my great-great-grandmother. I'm one sixteenth Cherokee. So she'd come from a long line of um, a long maternal line of healers, psychics, um, root doctors, midwives. She was taught at a very young age how to go out and gather herbs, and she passed those things to me. And so when I confided in her that I could, I felt like I was leaving my body like a bird and soaring to this mountain, she never shut me down. She believed me. She just said, you know, these are things you probably don't want to take outside the home because not everyone believes these things. Um, so after that, I, I was changed um, in a physiological way. I was, I'd always been an animal lover but I was drawn to animals that were injured, birds, um, my pet cat, neighbor's dogs. And I always felt this intention of healing them. Even as this very young child, I felt drawn to a healing um, 
ability is, is the best way to put it. I, my intention was so strong for these things to improve that they seem to actually improve. I was also drawn to plants um, and trees that weren't doing well. My dad loved to plant trees and it kind of became the family joke, you know, we'll get Pam, you know, to lay hands on this tree and it will be okay, or these plants for the garden. And so I had a knack uh, towards healing as a very young child. And I think that came through my maternal bloodline. Um, but things, you know, I, I just have had a lifetime of high strangeness. As a 10 year old, I um, was in bed one night and my mom worked second shift at a local um, nursing home. So my dad had left to go pick her up and my big sister was in charge. So I, I remembered those um, details of just lying there in bed. I, I would try to stay awake from home, but I was dozing off, but I felt a presence by the bed and I thought my mom had come in. I opened my eyes and there stood two beings dressed in black. Uh, one was a male, one was a female. They were dressed in black, um, tight-fitting turtlenecks, tight-fitting black pants, very good-looking people. They had very chiseled features. Um, light brown hair. The man's hair was a little bit below his turtleneck. The woman had shoulder length hair with bangs. Um, and they didn't say anything, but the man was holding a giant timepiece in front of him. And then he said, we're here to balance your karma from the beheading of a sacred white elephant. Um, so they went on to explain that like in another lifetime, possibly 5,000 years previous, I had been responsible for the beheading of a sacred white elephant. And they were there to balance my karma from that lifetime. Um, and I can tell you, as a 10-year-old child raised in a Southern Baptist community, I did not know anything about the Hindu religion or sacred white elephants. Um, this was all pretty frightening for me to see these two beings standing there. But the man had this giant timepiece, and he said, as the hands go from 12 back around to 12, we're going to take you. And I watched this timepiece tick around. And then I was floating out of my bedroom on my back. And I was in a brightly lit room um, on a table. And these two beings were behind me at the top of my head doing something. I, I don't know, some sort of procedure. I couldn't move. I could just like look backwards and see just a little bit of them. I knew that they were back there. I could see enough to know they were there, but I could not see what they were doing. I was floated back into my room. And when I woke the next morning, I remembered everything. and. It, I, it was very scary to recall that, but even more frightening when I went to start to get ready for school, I had a bright rash from my neck up. My entire face and neck was covered with this bright red rash, or it was so fine, like a sunburn or fine, fine rash. And course I didn't go to school that day my parents took me to the doctor the doctor really couldn't explain what was going on he prescribed some ointment and I ended up being out of school for a week or two until this this redness subsided um I did learn later in life that many people experience that when they've been taken on board a craft 
and had a different kind of exposure, um, possibly at a, a you know radiation exposure or something that as humans we're not used to being around. But it's also interesting that you know, they were balancing my karma for the beheading of this elephant. So I don't know if just them working in my head area caused this rash, but um, I was quite changed after that. I mean, it it kind of blew everything out of the water that I understood about life. Um, and it, it affected me a great deal. Um, but about less than three months later, I was on the front porch of my home. It was a summer evening. My mom and dad was sitting there. It was after dinner. We were just enjoying the the nice weather sitting out. And I, I was there with three of my siblings. When my little uh, five-year-old brother jumped up and pointed across the road and was saying, look, look, and we all looked, and above this stand of southern pines was a silver disc just sitting there. This, you know, your typical flying saucer, the, the silver disc that, you know, we've all seen drawings of, renderings of, reports of, just hovering above these white pines. My parents saw it. My siblings saw it. Um, it must have sat there for a minute or two, and it shot, that was to the east, it shot directly to the west in the direction of Pilot Mountain, the mountain that I could bilocate to as a child. And um, I didn't realize the significance of that, significance of that trajectory until much later in my life. Um, so that was another occurrence, uh, sort of ET related. Um, and just what I thought were dreams of seeing craft in the sky at night as a child, I, I, I would end up outside. Um, and the next day I would recall these, seeing these craft, but I thought they were dreams. Um, you know, as I've become older, I, I'm, I realize that they perhaps weren't dreams. Um, that I had been opened up to this other realm of consciousness and of um, of being. Let me ask you a few questions here. Who sure. do you think it was that reached down and brought you to that village in your first NDE? Well, you know, as this not barely a six-year-old child, and I'm not religious, I am spiritual, but at that time... I was coming from a Christian background, and I thought it was Jesus. I really did. Um, just the way he looked, the hair, the glowing, almost like, you know, robes or this light surrounding his body. Um, so, you know, as a child, I thought it was Jesus, but... Perhaps it was my spirit guide that that took me there, or an ancient ancestor um, that's more highly evolved um, as a as a celestial or light being, energy being. I didn't mention this previously in the introduction, but you have a master's degree in anthropology. So with that background, did you ever? take a look around the globe and see if you could find a village that would be similar to what you saw during your NDE? I have, and most of them tend to be in that area of, you know, biblical recall, like um, in, you know, the Middle East, uh, very similar the, the way the the homes looked, you know, sort of stone and and stucco and the stone walls. And even though there was greenery, there was also like hills that didn't look like the mountains that I'm used to seeing here with trees and lots of, um, you know, foliage. Um, off in the distance, they appeared to be more 
rocky. Um, the landscape appeared to be more rocky. Um, and just the the brownness or the oliveness of their skin um, sort of looked for in that era of the Middle Eastern um, depictions that you would see throughout history. So do you think that this being was showing you a past life? I do. I think uh, that it was a past familial connection um, to that region. And I connected with this one little girl, the one that I really, you know, eye to eye, soul level contact, who I ended up meeting in this lifetime as a nine year old. Um, and what's really strange about this, this lifetime encounter with her was that she was dying. Um, she had leukemia. I was taken as a visitor to my uh, brother's church. Um, he married a, a woman whose father was a Pentecostal holiness pastor. And occasionally I would visit that church. Um, so I was there one Sunday in the um, Sunday school and in walked this little girl. And it was her. It was the same little girl that I had met three years before during that experience. I mean, I knew that it was her and, and she connected to me and came and sat beside me and we held each other's hands and I'd never met her before. Um, she had very sparse hair. And afterwards, I asked my sister-in-law, you know, what's wrong with her hair? And my sister-in-law told me that she had leukemia and she was undergoing treatment. And I went back subsequently several times to visit the church and met her. And then one Sunday I went back and and she had passed away. So. I met this, you know, person that I'd been related to in this lifetime, met possibly thousands of years ago um, in this lifetime. And maybe that was the purpose of that experience, um, was to reconnect with her in this life. So are you saying that this NDE that you had was planned pre-birth? I think it was, yeah. I think it was pre-planned not only to elevate um, my consciousness, but to to make that connection with her. And perhaps she and I have been connected through many lifetimes. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I would like to research that a little further. Do you think that you were also in another lifetime previously an ET? And that's why these ships have visited you? Um, I have had some regressions in which I went to a planet that was all water, like a water world. I've had a couple of NDE guests go there during their NDE. Oh, really? Yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I do think that I've had and of maybe more than one ET lifetime on a water world. That's interesting. Well, let's fast forward in time to the OBE you had when you were a teenager. Yeah, so um, I had my tonsils out rather late in life. You know, most people have them out as a small child, but I was 16 when... I had my tonsillectomy, and um, I, I evidently um, we could not be roused um, in the recovery room. So I underwent the tonsillectomy. I'm in the recovery room. They can't um, wake me up, so they brought my family in. Um, and it's at that point that 
I recall sitting up on the table or the bed. I sit up, I look around, I can see my mom with her head bent and she looks like she's praying. My brother and sister-in-law are at the foot of the bed and, and they appear to be in prayer. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, what's going on here? Um, so I, I get off the bed and I turn around and I'm still lying in the bed. So that really blew my mind. Um, you know, I could clearly see myself lying there. I could see the blood pressure cuff on, the oxygen uh, in the nose, the nurse sitting on the other side of the bed for my mother, writing, you know, I guess vitals down. Um, a sister crying over in the corner. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, crap, I need to get back in my body. But I walked around a couple of times before I kind of figured out how to get back in. And and I just like went back over and sat down in the bed and laid back down. Um, and the next thing I know, I'm opening my eyes and my family's standing over me and, you know, my mom starts crying and my sister's crying and they're like, oh, thank God you're awake, you're awake. And, and of course, you can't speak clearly after a tonsillectomy, but I remembered what had happened and the nurse is there and the only thing I could think was maybe there were mirrors in the recovery room and, you know, I could see these things going on. And so I managed to croak out, you know, are there mirrors? Were there mirrors in the recovery room? Because at this point I was back in my, my room out of the recovery room. And she's like, no, honey, there aren't any mirrors in the recovery room. And, and I was like, okay. And, um, it was after I returned home, I, I shared that experience with my mom about what had happened. And um, I know that, you know, I was out of my body. There's no doubt I explained, you know, what I'd seen and she verified that she was, you know, had her head on, on the bed and she was praying and that my brother and sister-in-law were at the foot of the bed and the nurse was where I, I said she was. And so that was just another um, experience that continued to validate that, you know, we're not just this flesh and blood body, um, that there's a consciousness that resides in and outside of this physical form. Do you think you're at a level in your life where it's become easier for you to get out? Yes, um, I can. I can get out of my body just taking a nap, like in the afternoon, if I choose to lie on the sofa in the living room. I can go out into my yard and into the driveway um, and then back in my body. Um, it's it's kind of easy to pop in and out. Um, and particularly during meditation, um, I can easily go out and um, experience other realms, um, particularly in guided meditation, um, which I've participated in quite often. So yeah. Is there, is there some sort of procedure that you have to do to leave or does it spontaneously happen? For me, it just spontaneously happens. Um, now with the guided meditation, I do um, listen to the hemisync tones, and, and that seems to really facilitate a further travel uh, to other, like, maybe, you know, it, realms of existence. Whereas if I just choose to lie down in the afternoon, I, I typically just, like, can go out into my yard or on the front porch. Um, but with the hemisync guided, 
I can actually go much, much further. With Hemisync, are you using like the Monroe Institute app or something? Yeah, yeah. I have, I use that app. Which meditation are you using on there to do that? Um, I participated um, with, um, oh gosh, and I'm so embarrassed. I'm not recalling his name. His first name's Scott. Um, he does um, an online hemisync um, meditation. Scott, Scott <laughs> Taylor? Remember. Yes. Thank you, mm -hmm. Scott Taylor. Um, yeah, he. I did a, like an 18-week um, hemisync course with he and um, a really great group of folks. And, you know, Scott trained with Bob Monroe at the Monroe Institute. Um, and he developed sort of his own hemisync um, meditation based on, you know, about 30 years of research. Let's move forward to your next NDE. Okay. Um, so I was uh, in my early 30s, finishing up undergrad school under a tremendous amount of uh, stress because not only was I going into final exams, I was working double shifts at a, at a local restaurant, working my way through college. Um, and I'd had a history of ulcers. And so this one particular Friday night, I was at work uh, finishing out the dinner shift and my ulcer had been bothering me for a couple of days. I'd run out of my medication. Um, but that evening uh, at this on this dinner shift, it was just about unbearable. Um, I was drinking milk, you know, whatever I could do to try to calm it down. And at one point, I was almost bent over with pain. Um, and then I felt sort of a little pop um, from in the midsection. And the pain stopped and I was like, oh, great. You know, the milk finally worked or something. You know, I'm, I'm no longer in pain. I was able to finish out my shift. The next day, I um, when I woke up, I felt a little sick on my stomach, but just figured, you know, I'd not eaten a lot the previous day. And with this ulcer thing, I just kind of attributed it to that. Um, ended up doing quite a bit of yard work. And um, as the day progressed, I, I felt, you know, more nauseous and developed a headache. And but my husband and I had planned a really nice dinner with some friends that evening at a gourmet restaurant. And, you know, always working the table side of the gourmet meal, it was nice to think, OK, I'm going to be waited on. I, I don't want to miss this nice dinner. So I forced myself to go out that evening. I had um, duck with the cherry sauce and some red wine. And when I got home, I became really sick, threw up. There appeared to be blood, but you know, I'm thinking, well, I had the duck with the cherry sauce. I had the red wine. So I even called my husband in and he was like, yeah, you know, you remember what you had for dinner? just kind of blew it off, um, even though I felt really, really bad. Um, so went to bed. The next morning, um, Frank got up to go to a flea market. He got up about six o'clock. I had planned to go, but I felt so sick. I just thought there's no way I can go. All I wanted was a big glass of Coca-Cola. And that's all I could envision. I was so thirsty. And so he went downstairs and I knew we didn't have any Coke in the house. We, I didn't keep that kind of stuff around. So I yelled, I got out of bed. I managed to get out of bed, yelled down for him to bring a Coke back when he came back to town. And that's the last thing I remembered. I, I turned to go into the upstairs bathroom and lights out. I was gone. Luckily, he heard me fall. And came upstairs, found me on the floor, kind of wedged between the, the wall and, and the commode, managed to get me up. I wasn't breathing. My eyes were kind of rolled back in my head. He put me on the bed and started CPR. Well, at that point, I was off 
into this incredible journey. I I was on the side of a mountaintop, a snow-capped mountain. I looked down, there was snow under my feet. I was very highly elevated. I could tell I was on top of a mountain. And looking out, I could just look down on the most beautiful emerald green valley. The color is indescribable. The green, the greenness of this valley. And off in the distance was another mountain range, also snow capped. Um, and just the bluest, deep blue sky, like you're verging on outer space, um, that deep, deep blue. But in the middle of this valley, there was one solitary tree. And it, it spoke to me. It was the tree of life. I knew that as I looked down in that valley, on that tree, it was the tree of life. And as soon as that thought entered my head, I was under the tree. Um, and it was like a scene from Bambi. There was every animal imaginable. I mean, every single animal, birds singing, there were dogs, sheep, cats, lions, tigers, elephants, you name the animal, it was there. And in the midst of all these animals was my my Rottweiler, who had passed away three nights before on that on Thursday night before I had the pain on Friday night, she had passed away at two in the morning. She was fourteen. I was with her when she passed in our in our home. Um, and she was there, but she was young again. She looked like she was about two years old, just healthy and shiny and and wiggling and moving her little hips. And and I remember getting down on my hands and knees and just sobbing and holding her head. Um, I was so happy to see her and kissing her. And so I didn't have that typical near-death experience of going through a tunnel and seeing deceased relatives. I just popped onto this mountainside and saw this incredible green valley with all these animals in the tree of life. Well, in the distance, I could hear my husband calling me over and over and over. And I finally gave in to his voice. And as I gave in, I wished, kind of wished back up to consciousness, opened my eyes and he said, don't move, the ambulance is on the way. And it was at that point, it was like my, my consciousness split in half. I was in my body. I could feel myself in my body. I felt sick. Um, I could see him standing over me. But I was also over in the corner of the room at the ceiling observing that scene. I could see my husband, you know, telling me, don't move. They're on the way. Then I could hear the paramedics coming up the stairs. I could see them like working on me, putting me onto the gurney. I followed them down the stairs, out the front door. I saw them put me in the ambulance. I followed the ambulance and saw myself in the emergency room. And while I was in the in the emergency room, I coded twice. They had to like bring me back. And the second time, I, I did not regain consciousness. I was off into the place, I think, is the where you go in life between lives. Um, Michael Newton talks about that in his books, the life between lives place that you go. And it was a beautiful garden. Um, and I met my spirit guide, or one of my spirit guides, a Buddhist monk named Hote. And um, he showed me things. He showed me that I'm an animal caregiver in my life between lives. So when I go over, 
I take care of the animals. And, you know, that made perfect sense as to what I'd seen under the tree in that initial experience. And the fact that I was drawn to healing animals as a child, I've always been, you know, very connected to animals. So all of that resonated with me at this spiritual soul level. Um, and other things happened. I remained in that state of coming in and out of consciousness from that garden into my body. I, I would come in, up to consciousness and see people in my room. I was in ICU uh, for three days, 72 hours, and I would go back to this place. So this went on for 72 hours until I fully came back into my body and recovered and ended up in staying in the hospital for about a week. But what had happened, the ulcer had perforated and I had almost bled out. I lost over half my blood volume. I had to be transfused. Um, and it was difficult to find my blood type. I have RH negative blood. And so that was not easily accessible. They screened my entire family. None were suitable uh, donors. So that part was a little touch and go, but they, you know, they found the blood and um, finally, you know, got enough blood in me. I guess that's when I, I came back fully. Uh, but I was hanging in the balance for about 72 hours. And, and you know, I learned later that, um, they were, my family had even started kind of making some arrangements that, you know, in the event that I didn't make it because at times it appeared that I was not going to, but, um, but I did. And I, I was really changed after that experience. Um, I was changed physiologically, um, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, you know, what I experienced as a child and a teenager was nothing compared to this experience. And I knew it once I got out of the hospital and my husband brought me home. When I got out of the car, I could see the energy coming from everything. All the plants in the yard, and it was a spring, spring day, the azaleas were blooming, the the lilies, the oak tree had leaves. We have a like a 300-year-old oak tree in our front yard. And I could see the energy coming from that tree. And I'd been able to sense energy as a child when I would lay hands on, but this was a, a whole different level of energetic um, aura coming from everything. And it it took my husband a long time to get me, drag me inside. You know, he just wanted to get me inside and get me to bed. But I couldn't stop touching these plants and I was hugging the tree. And, and I was like, can't you see the energy? Can't you see the energy coming from everything? And it was overwhelming. And that stayed with me for about a year, uh, that intense, energetic, feeling coming from everything. I couldn't grocery shop. If I touched the shelves at the grocery store, or blue arcs would come and shot me. Um, I couldn't turn lamps on, lights on. I would blow light bulbs, light fixtures. Um, so I knew that my energy had really been ramped up from that experience. And that prompted me to study healing touch. I, you know, I thought I really need to do something with this, not just, you know, hold it in. So I um, took a curriculum at the medical center where I had a 30 year career. Um, we had a great uh, complementary and alternative medicine department, and they offered a healing touch international um, as a therapeutic um therapy of working within the aura similar to reiki um they offered that to their patients so there was training available to me and i reached a level four certification in healing touch 
brought on by that near-death experience. And I've been, you know, very successful in working um, on family and friends and and people in need um, since that happened. Besides being able to sense and see this energy, did you have any other changes within you that could be considered psychic? Um, yes, I, I've had what I would say are psychic dreams off and on throughout my life, but they seem to be occurring more often um, and not like anything astounding, just little things, you know, that like, a, you know, driving, I would dream that I was on the way to the grocery store and there's a new stoplight at this intersection where there had only been a stop sign before. So a couple of days later, I get in my car, and, you know, and I'm not dreaming. This is real life. I go to the way to the grocery store and there's the stoplight the new stoplight so little things like that um dreaming about people that you know i hadn't seen in years that would suddenly call me out of the blue and want to have lunch um you know nothing to predict the future or any catastrophic event although i've had a couple of those um but on a regular basis just dreaming small things um being almost being able to read people's thoughts. Um, I know that sounds kind of fun funny, but uh, I sort of have the knack of doing that, uh, knowing what people are thinking. And um, I'm not always on cue, but oftentimes I am. I can read people really well. That happened, um, I think, as a result of the near-death experience. Um, just being more in tune to animals and their needs, uh, healing birds, a lot of birds, um, being very connected to the earth and to plants, um, which has led me to uh, dowsing, you know, trying to connect even further with the earth through dowsing and tapping into energetic systems. Um, but I would say, um, what really heightened quite a bit was paranormal activity. I've, I've been in this home for about 40 years and I've, I've had paranormal experiences throughout that 40 years, but it really seemed to ramp up after that near death experience. And I don't know if it, if the activity was always there and I just wasn't cognizant of it until after that experience, but it seemed to become more frequent. Uh, objects being moved, um, apparitions, voices, uh, so a real connection into the paranormal. And that kind of led me into becoming a paranormal investigator. I thought, you know, heck, I've had this lifetime of really strange occurrences, seeing people, hearing things, having these experiences, and now I seem to be, you know, interacting with with spirits, uh, so I decided to take it to a level of um, becoming an actual um, investigator with equipment, and and so we're in, like in the early two thousands. That was uh, very popular. There were a lot of TV shows, and equipment equipment was readily available online, and. Um, so I chose some paranormal investigative equipment, uh, what's called a spirit box. It's an SB7, and that's a transcommunicational device uh, based on theories that go all the way back to Edison and Tesla and Radiv. You know, there's a long history of electronic voice phenomena that's uh, not recent. Uh, it's been studied for over 100 years. And... Um, so this device seemed really, um, you know, legitimate, developed by an audio engineer who had lost a daughter um, and wanted to communicate with her. But anyway, it, it's a transcommunicational device that sweeps um, FM radio frequencies at a very high rate of speed 
almost like through the entire FM frequency in just a second or two, you know. So you're basically just getting white noise through this box. But it's almost a tool that like a medium could use to communicate to the other side. So I researched that, obtained one, got a digital recorder, 35 millimeter camera. And but I didn't want to investigate the paranormal for the fear factor. You know, I wasn't into running, scared out of a location. I wanted to figure out how are these people coming through? How, why are we having these experiences with people that we perceive as being dead? But clearly they're coming through somehow. They're communicating. Um, so I approached it as an anthropologist and archaeologist. I thought, you know, when I go into a dig site, I learn as much as I possibly can about the culture that occupied, occupied that ground. So that's how I approach these paranormal investigations. What can I learn about the people that lived on these locations? So being in the South, there are tons of historic sites dating back into the 1600s. And so I sought out historic sites of that nature, obtained permission from management to go in and conduct these investigations. But I would go in knowing everything about the population. Sometimes taking these sites back to the original land grant from the English kings. Um, one example is, is the Wampy House outside of Charleston uh, on Lake Moultrie. And its original land grant was um, given in like the 1690s. So I would go in addressing these families by their names and bring bring myself up through the layers of occupation. And these populations loved it. They, just like any of us, you know, we want to share information about ourselves. They're the same way. And so I asked questions about their daily lives, the ethnography, um, you know, what, what did you do for a living? What kind of foods did you eat? Did you have children, pets? What games did the children play? And just obtained incredible information about these sites, about these populations that I could then verify on the back end through um, historic research, um, word of mouth, at local libraries, online. And oftentimes I would solve um, questions that the management had about certain places on the property um, or where something um, had been reportedly located and they weren't sure that that building was actually in that location, I could locate the, the site where it was located. Um, so a lot of validation through this paranormal information um, and clear voices coming through telling me their names and that they could see me. And so I had a research partner and we did that for about three years. We had an LLC and I did that in conjunction with my full-time job um, at the medical school. So I was quite busy. We did well over 100 investigations, presented up and down at the, uh, the East Coast, uh, presented at Duke University at the Ryan Research Center. We presented at Clemson University um, to lots of um, student groups. Um, and so in 2013, I was invited to present um, at Dragon Con, and that's the East Coast version of Comic Con. It's held in Atlanta, Georgia, I think every year in August. Um, and that particular year, they had a paranormal and a UFO track. And so I was invited to present. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation of my paranormal research 
combined with quantum theory, because about two years in to the paranormal investigating, I started receiving electronic voice phenomena indicated that indicated these beings weren't coming through from historic timelines. They were actually coming through interdimensionally. So when I would ask, where are you from? Expecting them to say, you know, um, Atlanta, Georgia, or whatever, they would give me names of places I didn't recognize, or how are you coming through? You know, I always would ask, how, how can you come through to me if you're dead? Um, they would say wormhole, portal. So I started getting these off-planet communications, and and recognizing this, I would ask about their dimension. And so I would get the names of their dimension, their planetary system. So I did this combination presentation of the paranormal and quantum theory showing this combination of historic timelines with this off-planet communication. And fortunately, that year, Stanton Friedman was presenting on Roswell. Stanton was a um, physicist who kind of really brought back to life the whole Roswell incident from 1947, I think, uh, in New Mexico. And um, he was presenting on Roswell. Well, he sat in on my quantum theory presentation and was really impressed with the scientific approach to the paranormal. Afterwards, he came up and, and um, suggested that I meet a friend of his, Kathleen Marden. Kathleen is the niece of Betty and Barney Hill. They were the mixed race couple that had the really the first uh, well-known abduction case in the early 60s up in New England. And so he said, Kathleen would be very interested in meeting you because not only has she had ET experiences, she's also had paranormal experiences. So I, I developed a relationship with Kathleen um, and I met she and Denise Stoner. Denise Stoner is uh, very involved in MUFON and is an experiencer and also uh, a paranormal investigator. So I traveled to meet Kathleen and Denise um, in 2015. And Kathleen thought it would be a good idea to um, sort of showcase the paranormal methodology because Denise had been having some activity in her home that she wanted to uh, sort of get to the bottom of. So I conducted a paranormal investigation, solved a lot of the questions that she had. But while I was there, some of this off-planet communication started coming through. And Kathleen said, you know, it would be really neat for you to go to a location where there's been reputed um, UFO and ET activity. She said, I know a gentleman in the eastern part of North Carolina that I can introduce you to, um, and maybe you can go to his property and conduct one of your investigations. And so that sounded like, you know, a cool thing to do. And she introduced me to Chris Bledsoe. Um, I contacted Chris and ended up going down to his property in June of 2015. Um, and spent, um, got down there about one in the afternoon, spent the day getting to know him and his family, um, and later that evening going out to conduct an investigation as I, I normally would, but with more questions directed towards the off-planet, uh, communication, and particularly knowing Chris's background at that point that he had had, um, an encounter in 2007 by the Cape Fear River. And he had also had a lot of activity on this property, particularly at the site of this catalpa tree 
um, that would spontaneously burst into flames and burn and they couldn't put it out. And people like uh, Grant Cameron and John Alexander have all been to that property. And um, so uh, we went out, we thought it'd be great to position ourselves um, at the base of this Catalpa tree uh, because that seemed to be a location of a lot of the activity. And I set up a night vision camera uh, behind the tree and we investigated on the other side of the tree. And so I approached it like I normally would. Who are you? Um, where are you? And immediately started getting directions that, that they were to the left of the moon. They were above us. Um, and so, you know, we just kind of bounced questions off what we were hearing. And there was a bright object to the left of the moon. And we debated for some time about whether or not it was a star. It just looked too bright to be a star compared to the other stars in the sky that evening. And um, so we're, we're standing there, we're asking questions, and the bright light is there. And then the next thing I know, we're standing there. It's myself, my research partner, and then Chris is on the other side of her. We're staring at the moon. The bright light is gone. And we're all just kind of swaying. And I felt really sick. And I said, you know, I, I don't feel well. And they said they didn't feel well. And, you know, prior to that, I had the spirit box in my hand. I had the digital recorder. Um, my research partner had equipment. We had a 35 millimeter camera. None of that is in our hands. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, where's our equipment? And we look around and it's on the ground behind us at the base of that tree turned off, which is totally, you know, counterintuitive to the purpose of the investigation is to capture evidence with our equipment and it's lying on the ground turned off. So, but we're just really dazed and not feeling well. And I just kind of chalked it up to it being an extremely long day. I'd driven three hours. You know, we'd talked to the family for like eight hours, done this investigation. I just thought I'm really tired. So we gathered up the equipment my partner went around to get the camera with the night vision camera and it's still running. It had not been turned off. We go in the back of Chris's house. His wife comes running out of the bedroom frantic saying, where have you been? And we were like totally caught off guard by that. We were like, we were outside. And she said, no, I had been looking for you, you weren't outside. And she said, it's one o'clock in the morning. So we had gone out at 10. Um, it felt like, you know, we had only been out there a short period of time and she, she's telling us it's one o'clock in the morning. So again, I just chalked it up to being tired and I had this three hour drive home. So she made us coffee. We couldn't explain where we had been when she was looking for us. Um, and we packed, you know, drank coffee, packed up our equipment, got maybe a mile up the road from their house and this huge bright object shot from like the south to the north across the top of these trees and shopping center. And it was so bright and so low to those treetops, we didn't know what it was. We just thought, was that a shooting star? I mean, that was way too close to the trees and much too large and going in a trajectory that a shooting star wouldn't go. But at any rate, like I said, we were dazed and we barely talked the three hours home, whereas normally we're very chatty after an investigation. We get back here, you know, it's almost daybreak. My partner had to drive to back to Georgia. 
So we grabbed a couple hours sleep. She left. I start reviewing the audio that I had gotten on my digital recorder. And it only ran for 45 minutes. And I'm thinking, well, what the heck? We went out at 10. We didn't go into one. I should have three hours of recording here. And I've only got 45 minutes. Um, or no, excuse me. I had an hour and 15 minutes. That's what it was. So we went out at 10. I would have recorded, I guess, to about 11.15. And so we had an hour and 45 minutes of missing time that could not be accounted for. And what was really strange at the end of that recording, my partner says, so you want us to turn off the equipment like she's talking to someone else. And then I pipe in and say, yeah, maybe we should turn the equipment off. And I'm thinking, I don't even remember saying that. And why would we turn the equipment off? And who is she talking? Who's she taking direction from? Um, you know, I couldn't hear any, anything on the recording. She's just saying, so you want us to turn the equipment off? So that kind of explained why the equipment was turned off, but I don't know who directed us. But anyway, I called her on her cell phone. I said, as soon as you get home, view your your audio look at the video because i'm missing an hour and 45 minutes of recording so it became apparent over the next several days that we had an encounter um there's audio coming from that video camera that continued to record and there's also video of these two beings that were on the property in that catalpa tree um, and through spontaneous recall and regression we've all had memories surface about what actually happened and we did have an encounter that night on on chris's property that's amazing thank you for sharing that with us pamela after watching this podcast People may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, I have a, a website, PamelaNance.com. Um, there's an icon, an email icon on the website that I can be emailed through. And the um, audio, some of the audio and um, the video still shots are on the website from that evening at Chris's if people are interested in, in looking at that, along with some of the paranormal um, evidence that I've collected and some of my theories. Well, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Sure. Um, I would just, you know, reiterate to everyone that that we're all conscious beings and that we're connected through this consciousness. Um, we're more than just these flesh and blood bodies. We, we are connected at a higher level through an ultimate creator. There's someone or something or some energy that is responsible for everything in the universe. And it's all tied to this consciousness. Um, and it really is all about love and loving each other. I know that sounds so cliche. It's very easy for people to say, you know, it, it's just all about love when we live in such a troubled world, but it really is. And, and there's no such thing as death. You know, we may lose this physical body that we have at this moment, but our consciousness does survive the physical death. And, and we have that opportunity um, to grow in each lifetime and become a more conscious, aware being um, and connect with our, our loved ones uh, after this, this physical life. Pamela, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest.
It was my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.